so let's let's just focus on the content ingestion and delivery because uh, this is something that's probably not a homework problem or if you want to deep dive into this one it's good to deep dive into this because uh, this this follows a pattern right like uh, uh, maybe dropbox content ingestion delivery youtube content ingestion and delivery netflix content ingestion and delivery probably you know box content ingestion and delivery so google drive content ingestion and delivery so they may follow some same principles so it kind of gives us some roi so let's see uh, uh, how how it uh, looks like okay okay just a second Nila, before we go there, um, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so um, it, when we do the logical block diagram and before that even identified um, all the functional requirements, um, there, there's probably high probability, at least for me, to miss out on one or two of those, right? Maybe I miss out on payments or I don't recall or remember them. Um, is that somewhere we lose points with the interviewer if we don't? cover everything uh, that a particular system might have in a threat focused problem no it depends on the functional requirements right so if if the functional requirements are well la well laid out then mm -hmm. you should not miss it right okay if it if the functional requirements are not well laid out definitely you are going to miss it but like the like the functional requirements if they are well laid out you will you will have to automatically it will come out from there right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that i agree um so you know, the interviewer has to help you out if you're like missing yeah out on your so the functional, functional requirement, requirement that's why the functional requirement is the bible right so the functional mm -hmm. requirement is the source of truth so if if yeah. if the if, interviewer says you know commit suicide in the functional requirement he says go and jump out of the window you have to go and jump out of the window right that's how it uh, so it's the so source of truth or the bible that you have to follow Okay, but if you miss one functional requirement, Nila, uh, is it going to be a problem? Do you think it's uh, going to be a subtraction of the points? No, I I don't know, right? Uh, I I personally have not dealt with breadth-oriented problems that much because I have never mm -hmm. interviewed, you know, a project manager or a program manager. But I I I won't be able to comment. Yeah, all my problems that I have asked are all for individual contributors, and they have been all very deep dive right one component deep dive into them right so the steps Thanks. that i went through today i have never neither i have faced because i am an individual contributor i have not faced them nor i have asked them right so i am not the best person you have to ask somebody who deals with product managers or engineering leader interviews yeah but again Thanks, yeah. the steps that that we discussed the high level steps we'll have to go through again i am not a product man, like i am not a, i am still an ic but i am now a co-founder right so i probably do better product management than a lot of product managers right so you have to be you have to don a few hats but again some things are probably more aligned to something else right so yeah if you are if you are lucky i have noticed interviewer if you are going to the right direction sometimes they give you hints also yeah yeah so they will so you have to kind of keep the person in your journey right so you have to ensure that you are taking feedback you are having conversations so he or she will also be you know invested in that so ensure that you are proposing um, by the way is it looking right or not i am in the right direction does it make sense so you have to kind of ensure that he or she is in the journey with you that you have to ensure. Okay, so now let's go and deep dive on this key value workload component. So let's see. So uh, tell me now, the like uh, I, I chose a key value because it's very rinsable and repeatable, right? It should shouldn't be that much of a problem to talk about key value workloads from here on, right? At least that much I should expect from you guys that if it's key value or streaming analytics, you should be able to converse. With more confidence, the compute intensive we don't know. Depends on the problem, but key value we should be uh, very uh, more well versed, right? So let's say I want you to Archie, I want you to design this content ingestion and delivery. Now, what as an engineer, what are you going to do? Um, 
I, I would follow the same framework that we have been following. Um, we have identified this to be a key value workload. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of start with a, thinking about the design, right? Um, looks like for content ingestion and then delivery, there'll be crowd operations, uh, right? So you have to have an API that can create, that you can use to upload your video. Um, and then you have to, you'll have a need to have a storage where you can store them. Um, and then okay. yeah, follow let, me, let me yeah, let me let me go with it. So yeah. again, I will okay. follow those four steps. So first of all, it's a key value workload. So I will go back to my lecture or Vivex lecture or anybody's lecture on how to design a key value workload. So I will first draw the anatomy. The anatomy is there will be an app tier that handles the business logic. There will be an in-memory tier that will mainly serve as a cache, and there will be a storage tier. Now in this case. There will be two storage tiers. One is for the metadata and one is for the data. So it will come with the data model, but this is how the anatomy would look like. Now, once I have done with the anatomy, I will figure out the data plane part, the logic, the data logic, the data plane. Scale is not in the picture yet. So we'll propose the data model, propose the APIs, discuss how the data will be stored, discuss how the APIs will be performed, right? Where is like so let's say that we go and we now give the anatomy. The anatomy is okay. I will have an app here that will handle the business logic. But here, I don't think there is any business logic as such. It's dumb, you know. There, there will be some business logic. So what, what business logic we, we will have? It's like the video encoding, video decoding. But that's going to be a bit more compute intensive side of things. From a metadata point of view, no business logic as such, right? It's just CRUD, CRUD APIs. From a data point of view also, CRUD APIs, but with some proprietary encoding or decoding that you have to do. That's the business logic. Right? Now the data structures that we have or the data model, we will have a metadata data model. The metadata data model will have the key, the content ID will be the key, and the value is the JSON object for the metadata like cast, screw, summary, thumbnail, whatever, whatever you can think of as the metadata. So for example, if I click on, so this is my user dashboard. This is the user dashboard that I have. So for user Nilay Mukherjee, this is the value, the dashboard. Now if I click on something here, then this is the metadata, right? The metadata is the thumbnail, the, the whole, you know, the direct, whatever be it, the, the terms, the summary, et cetera. So it's kind of a JSON document that we will have to store for every, every, every content. And if the content is like a episode or something, then there has to be a link to the parent content, right? And you can also keep related contents. So for every content, probably there is some related content, right? That, okay, if, if somebody is liking this particular movie, then there is a list of related movies now that who will populate that archie if i have to if, if that is the data model that i will also have a list of similar items probably it will come from the recommendation right so the recommendation is going to be that yeah content based recommendations uh, then so for 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 the data again content id will be the key and the value will be like the the byte stream of the trailer the byte stream of the various resolutions but opaque like byte streams that that that's the actual content all right now how to store the metadata again this is these are key value the operations will be crud so hash maps in memory row oriented in storage how to store the data definitely the data will be stored in file systems or object storages the APIs will be CRUD APIs for the metadata and file system read and write APIs for the file system data. Nothing very, very, uh, you know, very universal. Okay. So if, if my key value pairs are files, then I will have file system read and write APIs. If my key value pairs are metadata or like database kind of, you know, structured or semi structured JSON documents, then I will have CRUD APIs, right? Create, read, update, delete. For file systems, I will have file system read and write APIs. Very, very, uh, very universal. Like if it's a Dropbox, Google Drive, Box, 
YouTube doesn't matter, right? It's at the end, it's a file system data and some JSON data or you know semi-structured data that we are going to store. So the semi-structured data we will have row-oriented storage, like a Mongo or a Cassandra or a sharded MySQL, whatever be it, and hash maps in memory, Redis cache, memcached, whatever be it. And the storage definitely is HDFS, S3, any kind of file system storage. Yeah. Okay, so these are the APIs. This is nothing, nothing actually rocket science. What is rocket science here? Or what can make or break the interview is the if somebody asks me, especially if somebody asks me to say how Netflix does, you know, uh, compression, decompression, that part I will have to research. I am not an expert in that area. But from a data and APIs, uh, after taking the uh, live classes, I think I should be able or everyone should be able to at least propose this, except, you know, except the the algorithms because the algorithms you have to be either a domain expert or you have to read some research papers etc to do that right. okay so, so Nila, this, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead yeah um, from the top so when that uh, gateway service uh, it will um, um, it will uh, it will take you to the what i call this uh, content management uh, microservice the under the yeah. content management macro so we have three tier, app tier uh, uh, that yeah. uh, cache tier and you know storage so, tier so app tier will basically do two uh, things right one is um, uh, uh, upload uh, uh, the uh, say video to some location and then uh, then that no, video the app tier will take the video and store directly in the storage tier yeah that's it right nothing much yeah yeah. yeah okay and then um uh, okay when you're scaling then we'll talk about the cdn and all those stuff this yeah, time we are not talking about the CDN. yeah this is the logic yeah. that there will be an app tier now whether to put the app tier or whether to put this component in a cdn or just in a data center comes with scalability but 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 the logic will stay the same okay so this is the okay. logic now we see whether the logic needs scalability or not right so we are this is an mvp right let's say i some let's say this is this a new platform like netflix that has come up so they would do some poc so this is the poc part of it that okay this is how we will deal with it now definitely we cannot productize it right we have to think about the nfrs now right we have to think about the nfrs we have to see the requirements and then we have to productize based on what my nfrs are right so now it's a good time to talk about nfrs and why it's a good time to talk about nfrs is because we have laid down the data model we have laid down the api so it's 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 a good time to ask the right questions yeah i think i heard somebody asking something yeah. so he's so at this phase like uh, they can go deep into the compute a part also like i think the company yeah now depend right if you if you are if you are if you if your stars are not aligned that day then the interviewer can say hey give me a you know like how 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 would i you know what 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 is a good you know runtime encoding algorithm tell me right then you will be like if you have not researched about it then probably you know what will you do you will probably say yeah. i i don't know right yeah so can, or we can say like you know a little bit like okay so like it may end up uh, storing uh, three formats, one the 420p type of encoded file and then like 1k size and then 4k size. No, then they will say like, what is the algorithm? Like how, how would like, what is the actual, you know, underlying algorithm, right? Then you will have to, depends, depends how, how bad his or her mood will be that day, right? Or, <laughs> but that, that becomes a, like, because that's not principle and repeatable, it's easier to like like if the interviewer wants to screw you, he or she can screw you really in that direction, right? He can go deep into that and eliminate you, right? But other than that, you, I don't think there is not much opportunity of elimination except that part, right? That's what I'm saying, that the odds of elimination are higher in that part 
everything else you can cover after the live classes except that domain specific research if you didn't do and if somebody asks you about it then then you know the, uh, like that's the achilles heel right like you will probably pray to god that hey let him ask about everything else other than that right so that's how you will like in your mental in my mind you will probably think like that right now if you th- if you see that the interviewer is kind of navigating you to that part then you will probably become nervous you will probably give up at that point right yeah so nila one question so uh, i don't know if i'm asking or maybe a dumb question so when we store this kind of file in a blob and when we need to retrieve uh, you know this file and to send somewhere uh mm-hmm. is can these files be partitioned so that uh, you can have number of threads from and uh, and you so can we will you know, be, yeah definitely we will yeah so we have only talked about the logic okay blob can be partitioned okay that is wanted to okay we, we can yeah so we'll see how to like from from a performance and scale we have not yet dealt with the problem right so we okay. have just seen the from a data plane point of view what what can we do now we will bring in the performance and scalability right Okay, so okay, now okay. at this point it's a good time to talk about the nfrs so what kind of nfrs now it's a good time because the problem is very constrained the data models are also very well laid out the apis are laid out so what what nfrs are we looking for here rather than talking about you know thousands of nfrs in the beginning now we can really focus on the relevant nfrs for this microservice So, what are the relevant NFRs for this microservice? I'm thinking for one for replication for the fault tolerance. What else? Yeah, replication is definitely no brainer. What else? Uh, number of and, and, and number of videos. Number of contents, right? Yeah. So the number. So so it's data. So what did we say? What questions to ask? How large the data would be? Each data record. How large each data record would be? and how many data records so what is the corresponding question to how many data records here how many movies so it's good to know so what do you think what is the number of records like number of content ids or unique content ids what do you think anyone anyone has any idea number of unique contents in netflix for all Millions. users right yeah it's 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 this is the data model right There yeah maybe no, millions yeah millions so is the data model here why why are we talking about users the data model you have to be very very methodical there is no where is the user coming in this yeah 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 i got your point user is not there yeah a couple of thousand that would be i think few hundreds of thousands i think that's what it's going to be tens of I thousands so it's actually yeah. tens of thousands 10000 yeah. to 20000 so we can say 20000 that's a, that's not a bad number and what do you think the size of the metadata would be since it's a json object we gave some you know if you if you remember we said you know 10 10 to 100 kilobytes we can say right now yeah. from a data point of view 20000 unique contents but it's not going to be the key value now the values are going to be very large so netflix actually stores 3 gigabyte per hour for hd and 1 gigabyte for per hour for sd if 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 there are only two formats they store when i when i prepared this deck like 2 3 years before that's what i researched about but i am sure they they store probably archie will know more that they probably store more resolutions uh, not only two but depends on what you propose right but this is going to be large okay So now let's look from a storage point of view. So we are. So if you go back to the discussion about storage, what were the NFRs? The size of a key-value pair, the bounded. So this is a bounded data set. This is not growing like crazy, right? Movies are not added like junk tweets, right? So it's it's not a unbounded data. Twenty thousand movies, and if the metadata is ten or twenty kilobytes. 200 megabytes very negligible from the metadata is actually really really negligible even if it's 100 kilobytes to 2 gigabytes even if it's 1000 kilobytes 20 gigabytes right nothing so from a 
high level point of view metadata is not that large negligible the data so, is going to be really huge yeah yeah so go ahead key will be key will be like movie id and the value will be like movie name that's it right no 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 the value will be the whole whole shebang right director like a json object of okay 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 the whole information okay the movie the whole crap, right? yeah but yeah, title, that whole title crap can be like maximum 10 to 100 kilobytes yeah so that's the mm -hmm. whole crap even if it goes to 1 megabyte still then it's it's not making a large dent right it's it's still manageable right it's not it's not changing my scalability answers okay now, from a data point of view, definitely no brainer. Even your grandkid will say that Netflix has to scale for the actual content storage, right? And it comes from here, right? So let's say three gigabyte per hour and one gigabyte per hour. So let's say four gigabyte per hour per content. And if the content is, let's say, two and a half hours in average, then maybe 10 gigabytes per content. And there are 20,000 unique contents. So, so we will go with around 200 terabytes unreplicated and this is probably just having two resolutions now if i have more and more resolutions definitely is going to add to it right so what is that 20000 20000 movies and 10 gb is per movie size average yes yeah, so we said one hd one sd two formats mm -hmm. 3 gigabyte per hour for hd 1 gigabyte per hour for hd and if the movie is on an average two and a half hours if a single like there has to be an average length of a content so if mm -hmm. i take the average length to be two and a half then it's 10 gigabyte overall for a single guy Got so it. it's mm -hmm. yeah. again but i think as uh, days go by like i think like we may also have, i think they're also storing the 4k size no that will also yeah so different right uh, we, we only went for two so in our data plane proposal we have only two resolutions if the data plane proposal has 10 resolutions, then it will add to the, so everything yeah. has, has a cause and effect from the previous step, right? So whatever you have proposed in the previous step, this will come from the previous step, right? Nothing is, mm -hmm. nothing is coming from the sky, right? Everything is coming from the previous slide. Every decision that you are making now is based on something you have decided in the previous slides, right? Okay. So, now need to scale for throughput i personally don't feel that the metadata the metadata queries or the metadata reads are very high throughput i you may not agree but i personally feel that we don't spend a lot of time on you know clicking like probably in a day i click probably on 10 or 20 things the whole day and then there are all these users who are doing it so at a at a per second time i personally think that it's negligible up to you up to the nfr but definitely the delivery the delivery is going to be high throughput why because netflix actually uh, requires you to have broadband for delivering hd so and typical broadband is 3 megabytes per second if i take the typical broadband speed to be 3 megabytes per second that means that file system store where you are storing the data the file data that read api has to be driven at at a minimum of 3 megabytes per second per user and the nfr that is important here is how many users are watching movies at the same time around the world so yeah, around the world if 10 million concurrent users are watching movies that's an nfr that we need so it's around 30 terabyte per second globally the global throughput requirements is 30 terabytes per second definitely not a you'll have to scale for this so the metadata we don't need to scale the data we need to scale from both storage and throughput point of view that's the bottom line so that so that's the that's the insight that we gather now need to scale for api parallelization probably not relevant availability yes hotspots definitely this is one workload that is very hotspot prone why do you think this is very hotspot prone? Anyone? Maybe new release. Yeah. So it can be new release, or let me let me enable Alex and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, uh, be, yeah. I think it's yeah, one of the things that already new release, popular movie, 
Yeah, pretty popular obvious. movie. And we see there are only 20,000 key value pairs, right? The number of users are in millions and there are only 20,000 key value pairs. So definitely there, there is going to be a, a particular key will be shared, right? By multiple users, right? So in case of shopping cart or in case of, you know, LinkedIn profiles, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? My LinkedIn profile, my key value pair. Your LinkedIn profile, your key value pair. So from an user point of view to that data model, one-to-one -one correspondence. So they are not very hotspot prone. Most of the key value workloads are typically very much, you know, user, what do you call, user affine, right? So uh, not much, you know, like if I retrieve my own airline reservation, you retrieve your own airline reservation, no, not shared, right? But a movie is a shared data structure, right? So definitely hotspots and geolocation based distribution yes so that's where cdns or content delivery networks come in the picture why do we need content delivery networks is because this is an io bound this is not a cpu bound workload this is not an ops per second but this is byte transfer per second and as we said that we require a fat pipe so we require a pipe of three megabytes per second that kind of diameter we need to be able to deliver the content. So why do we need CDNs? Because we know from our ISP, from our Comcast data center or from at and whoever is the service provider, if I have paid for broadband, then the pipe that the service provider is providing from his or her data center to my house, that pipe is fat. But what about the pipe between the service provider and the actual data center. Now, if the data center is in the US and I am sitting in India, then I am not guaranteed that the pipe between US and India will be able to drive this three megabyte per second, right? I have no guarantees, right? So I will have to put a data center, a subset of that data center, a subset of that microservice. Again, the logic, the diagrams will be the same, but it will have a subset of the content and I will put that as near as possible to the ISP. So that's why we will build CDNs. CDNs are nothing but content delivery networks, a subset of the actual system, the actual microservice, not all the content, but relevant content to that region, depending on access patterns, depending on the throughput requirements. You just put a subset of that whole microservice in a particular region so that the pipe or the network latency between the CDN and the ISP is reduced as much as possible. The bottlenecks are reduced as much as possible. So what Netflix does is Netflix goes further. So Netflix has something called an open connect. So basically they have an embedded appliance. So this appliance is nothing but that distributed file system. The diagram will be the same as the distributed diagram with reverse proxy, file system servers, cluster manager config store. So that's that's the structure that they're, that they're actually embedding into the ISP itself. So basically, forget about the pipe between the CDN and the ISP. If you are just slapping your, <laughs> your subset of the microservice as a distributed, this is the distributed system, which is actually the final thing that we draw in our architectures, right? In our diagrams. If I can slap it directly in the ISP's data center, then there is no question about the pipe between the CDN and the ISP, right? So we can deliver content at the speed at which the ISP has promised the house, right? So this is like an embedded deployment. Again, you, you will have to have a lot of cloud. You will have to have a lot of partnerships to deal with this. But this is the best you can do, right? You are just cutting everything <laughs> like there is nothing to cut, right? You have just pushed your system into the ISP itself, right? Uh, uh, Wouldn't it be even better if you could take all the movies and just send it to the user's home? Ah, like put put this uh, put this distributed system in my home, right? Yeah, that yeah, that's the best. Yeah, yeah, but that's not going to scale, probably, right? Yeah, like if I take all this system, put it in my garage and then hook into it, then forget about it. Like, 
like somebody should do it some if 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 you guys have made money out of you know cryptocurrency please please take a subset of the seed like create a cdn right create a cdn yourself right you can create a cdn yourself at your house like take all the down like download you know thousands of movies put it in a distributed hdfs plug the hdfs right uh, no way like that's the fastest you can go right you you can try it out if you have money definitely you can try it out yeah. uh, i was only kidding sorry no no but you can try it out like people try it out yeah like building a file system a distributed file system is not the, like buy some you know buy some boxes store like 10 movies right build a distributed file system at your house and see whether you know uh, whether you can you know drive i'm sure you will be able to drive content at a huge speed not uh, physics right it's going to happen okay. so that's the reason we have cdns right for io bound io and network bound workloads typically we don't have cdns for cpu bound workloads because the they are not that pipe hungry as i said millions of ants insects they can pass through a small power outlet why because it's a staggered workload but a large python forget about it right you cannot push it through a small pipe right or if you want to push it through a sm- imagine pushing a python through a small pipe right how much time it will take to you know come from one side to the other side right it's not going to happen the pipe will probably burst or stuff like that right so definitely you need a very fat pipe for large key value if it's a very large key value pair that you are sending out but if you are sending even band you mean bandwidth right this is bandwidth right definitely yes so but if you are sending millions of small key value pairs because they are staggered somebody asked me right millions of ants is also like you know the size of the data millions of ants versus a large python probably the size will be the same but still millions of ants can pass through a small pipe while a large python cannot because it's staggered it's a staggered workload so and also cpu based systems are much much expensive compared to these you know storage these are storage based systems right they are not cpu optimized they are storage and storage is much much cheaper compared to cpu uh, i'm i'm sure you guys are aware of that right so any kind of storage based distributed systems very easy to build very easy to you know from a cost point of view also not that hard to replicate and push right but cpu based uh, vms or like uh, capacity planning for cpu you will have to shell more money right storage is cheaper than cpu so so th- that's the reason cdns why for io bound and network bound workloads to cut the network latency and also uh storage is much much cheaper than compute okay. now comes the actual productization of the system doesn't change from problem to problem the app tier if it needs to scale will have the same diagram the cache tier for for the metadata if it needs to scale again same diagrams diagrams don't change the storage tier if it needs to scale same diagrams except that some storage servers will be the json storage or row oriented storage and in case of file system it's going to be a file system server but the architecture or the control plane or the distributed system doesn't care right as a distributed system i don't care whether i am storing it as a file or whether i am storing it as a uh, you know uh, key value pair in a row oriented doesn't matter it's the data plane right all the distributed system does is take the request forwards it to the appropriate guy now let the guy do whatever they want with it right if you want to print hello world print hello world if you want to deliver the content to the end user deliver the content to the end user doesn't you know uh, one question yeah. uh, do we need to draw these diagrams for each of these tiers like if somebody asks then you have to right if somebody wants to deep dive then you will have to draw yeah okay okay now comes sharding so again these are key value pairs key value workloads so metadata no brainer from today onwards if i wake your grandkid up and say how will you shard a key value workload he or she will also answer horizontal not a big deal 
Now from data, we, again, it's a key value workload, so we can go with horizontal. But what happens if we shard horizontally? Does it, uh, does it create hotspots if we shard just by the movie ID, just horizontally, just by the movie ID? Will it create hotspots? Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. For example, yeah. Hunger Games, right? If I use, if the reverse proxy in the file system, uh, that distributed file system with the reverse proxy uses hash of movie name, then, you know, if I go for the same movie name, you are going for the same movie name, somebody else is going for, you know, the same movie, everyone will land up on the same shard. So that's why typically file systems, they go for hybrid sharding. So this is one example where we see hybrid sharding. So they shard the data, sorry, they shard the key values by both key as well as the value. So basically they chunkify the file and somebody was saying, right? Ranjan was saying that, uh, that typically file systems, they, they deal with file chunks. So basically they divide the, like if you read the Google file system paper, Google file system actually chunks files into 64 MB. So every 64 MB for every movie ID is, is designated a shard. So does this take care of hotspots a bit? What do you think? Yeah. It takes yeah. care because like each person will be watching a different chunk, a different time. Like, like each, each person, yeah. Like let's say me and Sridhar. Maybe we are both watching Hunger Games, but Sridhar may be watching the end. I may be watching the beginning. Maybe Ranjan is watching the middle. Maybe Alex is watching some portion. So the re there is some reduction. Okay. So that's why. Uh, and all fi if you see all file system APIs, there is a reason. Why all file system APIs, they come with an offset under length. Why? Because the chunk, because if you don't have the offset under length, and if you sharded by movie ID and chunk ID, and if you don't have the offset under length in the API, what will happen? If the reverse proxy does not have enough ammunition from the APIs to figure out which shard, what is going to happen? Scatter gather. Scatter gather, scatter gather is a throughput killer, right? So that's why file system read, there's a reason, right? Why file system read and write APIs always come with an offset under length. Why? Because it allows the reverse proxy in those guys to make it local rather than scatter gather, right? Scatter gather is a throughput killer, right? We know. So this so is how. Chunk, so chunk means if my. Um... So length of the my file, say for example, hundred MB, and then each so ten MB. Uh, if I divide by ten, so uh, total division is ten. Right? MB, right? Google file system. Yeah. So like every each chunk is sixty four MB. Like yeah, each chunk is six. Yeah, so then two chunks, right? Yeah. So and each so chunk has will be given an ID. Okay. So basically, anything that Google stores, they store in the Google file system, right? All your Google photos, all your Google mail, whatever, whatever is all their file system so, requirements are handled by Google file system, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no. So each question is like movie ID. I'm, when I'm creating the file, uh, uh, data modeling, I, I have a movie ID, I'm supplying that. But this chunk ID, I'm not supplying anywhere. So, chunk ID will be taken automatically by the system. Right? Yeah, so it will, it will probably either the client will divide it into chunks or somebody like, like for example, if you install Dropbox, Dropbox will chunkify it for you. So, there will be a client who will chunk it like. Okay, like Oracle ASM system. Okay. Yeah. So the file system client. The file system client. Like if I if I use AWS S3 API from my laptop, if I call AWS S3 API to upload something in S3, then that API, that file system, the client API is going to chunkify and push it, right? Yeah. So Nila, so like Nila this chunk no size. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my question is if there is no hotspot, like for example in Dropbox, like if uh, a user is trying to uh, download a specific file, okay. So in that case, uh, there is no need to do uh, chunkify, just a horizontal. But you never know, right? So you never know. So that's why typically file systems 
you never know right whether there will be hot mm-hmm. spots or not right like a photograph like somebody can like if if that photograph is so popular then a lot of people can you know uh, uh, see it right so so file systems typically universally will go with this chunky file because the file system read and write apis often often allow you to uh, to chunkify or often allow you to uh, uh, the the file system read and write apis are very amenable to chunks right they give you offset and the length so you can read from anywhere so you can do random reads as well as you can do sequential reads right if you want to do sequential reads you can read in parallel right i can prefetch all the chunks in parallel if i want to do random reads this will allow me to do random reads as well right very uh, at at like i don't have to create hotspots when i am doing random reads so file systems would definitely you know generally they would go for because they don't know right whether the underlying uh, like s3 right Dob- let's say dropbox uses s3 netflix also uses s3 right s3 doesn't know right whether there will be hotspots or not right? so so s3 will kind of make it an universal so it's it's so chunkifying is not harming anything right it is actually better than not chunkifying right so place me the card is yeah so nila two Nilek. questions uh, i'll make it uh, quick and uh, short so first thing the chunk size 64 mb is it like a universal value across the company or we can do oh, no, it as per our own it's an nfr right it's an nfr yeah as i said google okay. file system does it but some other file systems may you know change it according to okay okay uh, the second question is nila uh, on chunking right because all this streaming or what not so these are like goes through the protocol right so it's yeah, course, part of yeah. tcp ip and uh, http 1.2 it's part of the HTTP file system protocol it's 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 a i don't think it's tcp ip it's it's the it's the file systems protocol like the client and the server protocol yeah, we have chosen chunk size is one of the key design parameters we have chosen 64 mb which is okay. much larger than typical file system block sizes each chunk replica is stored in a, as a linux file so each chunk is like a file like a uh, physical file but uh, that's how they kind of store it so each chunk is like a physical file and then okay if i want this chunk read this file if i want let's say movie id hunger games chunk 1 that's probably another actual physical file in some file system server sure. uh second question is little off of the topic uh, nilay so do you know what protocol do you use for this particular streaming platform any idea at the end of the day these are file system read write apis right that's i all. see okay okay Thank so you. your your roku device or your smart uh, smart device is calling this you know read uh, like file system read apis so they have this like there will be a netflix like netflix's file system client right in sitting in that device that client is going to just issue these apis and what do you think what data structure do they have in that fire stick or roku device what data structure do you think the, those circular buffer they will have a circular buffer they will have a ring buffer it's yeah. it's a producer consumer queue so they will call this file system apis to produce and your tv or your device is going to consume now you just have to ensure that your production rate is higher than the consumption rate right if your production rate or if the read apis are not probably you know are not delivered at that speed at that 3 megabyte per second speed right or at a lesser speed then definitely you know your consumer will wait for the producer what happens if the queue becomes empty right there's a conditional mutex on which the consumer waits for the producer the moment there is a conditional wait on the queue you will start seeing you know circles right it, it will not work so it's a producer consumer queue a circular buffer that the so whenever you start watching a movie all these you know hey movie uh, hunger games chunk 0 hunger games chunk 1 hunger games chunk 2 hunger games chunk 3 just keep on asking for them and keep it keep it stored in the production like the ring buffer the circular buffer 
and let the consumer start consuming for it. So if you if you kind of look at YouTube, you will see that the producer there is a there is a progress bar of the producer and the progress bar of the consumer, right? The progress bar of the producer is like a gray bar, and the progress bar of the consumer is the red bar, right? So often, most of the time, you will see that the progress bar of the producer is much much ahead compared to the progress bar of the consumer. Now, if the progress bar of the producer is not ahead, then definitely there will be issues. So this is one case where you know uh, hybrid hybrid partitioning is used. Why hybrid partitioning? Again, to get rid of the uh, hotspots and the key value pairs are also very large, right? So makes sense to break them into smaller pieces. Um, now placements of shards in servers, uh, consistent hashing that does not change, right? Doesn't change from problem to problem. For any problem. Shards to servers, it's like the movers, right? They don't change their algorithm from house to house. So we will use just consistent hashing. Now replication, yes, for availability as well as for throughput as well as for hotspots. So even with sharding, there can be hotspots. If the movie is so hot that a lot of people are watching the same chunk of the same movie at a given time, the only way to reduce hotspots, if sharding is not reducing hotspots, the only other thing to talk about is replication. There is no other third party in distributed systems, right? Only sharding and replication. So we need replication for throughput in this case, and we need replication as well for removing hotspots. So, so whenever a movie is released, I am sure it will be replicated like crazy before the release happens. Yeah. All the replicas will be pushed to the appropriate CDNs. Now, if it's a globally trending movie or it's a global release. Then definitely everyone is going to, every CDN is going to be pushed with a lot of replicas. Now, if it's a local content, then it's it's business logic there. But then if the movie becomes cold or if the movie becomes, you know, uh, a flop, then I'm sure there there will be business logic to reduce the number of replicas as well. CP or AP, this is going to be an AP. It's a it's mostly write once, read many times. And that's why you can have a lot of replicas. Read from one, write from one, highest throughput, lowest latency, right? Uh, AP is the best for performance and throughput. And we don't have any, any constraints about consistency here, right? Nobody is changing the data as we are watching it, right? It's like archival data. So it's an AP system. So this is how we will probably discuss, you know, every every microservice if somebody wants to get into the details again from a key value workload microservice there was nothing much nothing rocket science but uh, but uh, you know from here on at least for key value workloads we should be able to go through this exercise in 10 20 minutes for compute intensive you definitely need to go through the homework problems figure out all the algorithms that are needed for the homework problems etc okay i think i will i will call it a day today so this actually concludes the the live class session this is just the start of the journey go through the homework problems try to create the decks and you will see that you know the you automatically the rinsable and the repeatable parts will become more clear what to focus on what changes from problem to problem will will become more clear but at least Go through the, if you have your support period, etc. Prepare these 2025 problems really very, very well. They will, they will help you for life. So prepare those, uh, like do all the due diligence. Like if it takes two days to prepare a problem, spend two days to prepare the problem. Don't shy away from it. But create that content and uh, that will help you. So practice. Uh, like do, don't shy away from spending time. Hey, I'm not able to do this problem in 20 minutes. Not a big deal. But I would say key value workloads, streaming analytics will be more predictable. So try to do them a bit more faster. But compute intensive components, definitely, you know, do research, uh, study blogs, or, you know, go through IKS contents, uh, the, the resources to to internalize those algorithms. 
Okay. Nila, one question. Okay. So when we do this practice problem, uh, how do we get it validated? Do we need to book the technical coaching session to? Yeah, yeah. The coaching know? sessions are the ones. Then mini mocks uh, sessions. So coaching sessions, mini mock sessions. Work between yourselves, right? Like uh, make study sessions out of if you if you know a few guys among yourselves, try to you know try to let's say one of you does one problem, the other does another, and share notes. So, uh, but the coaching sessions are are very helpful, and uh, it's like six months of support period, right? So, but don't go out to interview until you have done these problems. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I have a good one, guys. Yeah. Want to become a software engineer at Google? You can, like thousands of our students. You just need to learn from those who've already cleared Fang interviews. At Interview Kickstart, our interview prep courses are developed and taught live by 150 plus instructors from Tier One companies like Google and Facebook. Our courses are tailored to help you crack software engineering domain interviews including back-end, full-stack, machine learning, embedded systems, data science, and more. To learn more, book your free webinar slot today 